I've been studying um, marine environment and then after my PhD working on the, the exchange of nutrients into uh, and the contaminant into Bibles, I contact uh, Peter, uh, my, my dear Albert to, to work with him about aquaculture because I was thinking there was a nice connection with what I was doing and what the, the famous nutritionist he was and he still was, he still is. And uh, we came up with the idea of working on biofloc, which we never did, but uh, I had some skills on data, data digging and so on. And, and he had the idea of, of working with this uh, fish meal and, and fish oil production and competition and so forth and so on. And that was great. From this moment, I was uh, hooked to the aquaculture world. I mean, I was interested in, in the past, but not as much as this. And with him for the last 20 years now, we are uh, constantly collaborate on, on this topic. So, and I had the chance then to move to, to Sweden, to work a little bit with FAO, uh, to have another open overview of the aquaculture. And then, uh, and then now I'm in Monaco, in an agency who's uh, dealing with, um, with the environment more, but I'm still connected to the aquaculture, bringing the, the topic on the, on the plate because this is important for for the, the world and uh, also the aspect of sustainability. This is uh, really important for me. So yeah, that's a little bit about the, the general idea of, of my profile. Thank you, uh, uh, Mark. I think I will also ask uh, Albert to, to say something about uh, today's session, the importance, importance of today's session and the, the the journey we began at the beginning of uh, COVID last year, I think we are the we are the first one in the world. Now everyone is has a, has a webinar or seminars. We are the first one, and and where we came today, right, with AIC and the future. Uh, Albert, just two minutes, uh, two three minutes, right? Please. Yeah. No, thanks, Kabir and and Mark. You know, the topic today on sustainable aquifers is a very important one you know, not for today, but for tomorrow and and how we can ensure that the sector still grows in a in a good in a good way that's green and clean and and can also feed people. Uh, there have been many recent films on Netflix sometimes portraying aquaculture in a very bad light. And it's important that that we as an industry also um, give our our best put on our best face and also become proactive rather than reactive in terms of you know what we do and and how we how as an industry we're a food industry and, and it has to be green it has to be clean so i think the topic is very important um but also i think i'd like to introduce fanny from from singapore because we're also for the first time doing this series through through Tamasek Polytechnic in, in Singapore. So maybe Fanny could just say a, a few words about the Aquaculture Innovation Center and... Um, yeah, okay, please. thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Kabir and Albert and Mark for joining. And I, yeah, I also thank the opportunity to ANN for the opportunity for AIC to be a partner on this webinar series. So AIC is a um, center of innovation here in Singapore. We started in 2019 in July and we are based in Temasek Polytechnic. Um, and we are a consortium of nine or now 11 members, including uh, institutes of higher learning and research centers. So the focus is to provide services for the aquaculture industry here in Singapore, in the region and in the future, and who knows in the whole world. But Singapore now, the government is, uh, how can I say, they are in there's incentive for the production of food in the country. So there's, uh, mainly for aquaculture, but also for uh, agriculture, so vegetables. So we have this 30 by 30, which the challenge, which is to provide 30% of the nutritional needs by 2030. So there's a lot of uh, research and 
services and other studies going on and grants as well available to do research on how can we improve aquaculture or food production for food security in the future because we also had the issue while well, still going through this pandemic that causes a lot of disruption here in Singapore we depend a lot of imported goods so if we can produce at least 30 percent of nutritional needs is already a gain so this is uh, how AIC what's this is the role of AIC is to support the aquaculture industry in Singapore and in the region yeah thank you so, okay thank you Fanny and I think we can start with Dr. Albert Taken sustainability in aqua feeds with this new era for aquaculture and aquaculture Industries network with aquaculture innovation center dr albert taken thank you so the topic today is sustainable aqua feeds challenges and opportunities my favorite co-author mark metain is is with me here and um, it's important to say that the views in this presentation are our views not necessarily those of 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 other organizations and so everybody um can look at sustainable aquafeeds from from very many different viewpoints but this is really our own um view um just to give you some the in may this year we have the new aquaculture data from fao um i just wanted to present a few slides just summarizing some of these um, calculations. This table shows the main um, fed species produced in the world in, from carp to shrimp to catfish to lapia, other, other species, altogether about 48 million metric tons. Um, these are the ones that are fed mainly compound aquaculture feeds. These are the growth rates of the sector since 2015. And this is the, the estimated value of the sector. You can see that that shrimp is number two in terms of volume, over six and a half million metric tons. But by value, it's it's easily the most um, uh, valuable sector, and that's why um, so many people are growing shrimp now. And in the final column, you have the 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 major country producers, and you can see China, which essentially produces 60% of the world's aquaculture production, it's still very much a, a leader and an important player. Uh, the next slide shows uh, my our estimates of, of total feed production for these species, the percent of production on feeds, the estimated economic FCR, and then finally the, the estimated amount of feed. The total amount at the moment, our estimate is about 56 million metric tons of, of aquaculture feed. Um, again, all this presentation will be saved and, and people can have copies of this information. So this summarizes the 56 million metric tons of aquaculture feeds produced in uh, 2019, our latest estimate, and um, the major species groups. Um, the recent Altec summary shows uh, an estimated feed volume of about 50 million metric tons for the year 2020. The estimate of IFO, the International Fish Meal and Fish Oil Organization, their estimate is about 60 million metric tons. So we're all in the, in the same ballpark. So it's about 56 million metric tons of aquaculture feed. Uh, the main species again being carps, tilapia, shrimp, catfish, marine fish, salmon, freshwater crustaceans, uh, miscellaneous freshwater and diatomous species, milkfish, trout, and an eel. Okay. So, and then another figure, just um, because we, we're always interested in, in updating our, our values and our numbers, 71% um, of our planet is covered in, in water, in sea. But really, what contribution does, does, does this give in terms of our of our food intake. And at the moment, the latest information from the 
FAO food balance sheets, which also just were recently updated for 2018. Globally, aquatic foods supply about 6.8% of the total animal calories we consume, 3.2% of the animal fat, and about 16.9% of the animal protein that we currently consume. The important thing, although the earth is covered in, in marine water at the moment, half the fish that we consume, well, more than 42% are freshwater species, followed by pelagic species, demersal species, crustaceans, and, and other species. Um, if you look at the FAO food balance sheets, basically we produce at the moment on this planet about 5.28 billion tons of food and 1.4 billion tons of feed. Um, this is food that we don't actually consume directly, but in the end, we, we use it for, for other purposes. Um, and again, this compares quite nicely with the Ortec uh, value of about 1.2 billion tons of, of animal feed produced on the planet. So this compares quite nicely. Uh, and again, another important point I always keep on re-emphasizing is 84% of the fish that we farm are actually freshwater species. Okay, so that was a bit of an introduction with the new um, numbers. But let's took a look at some of these issues and, and challenges that the industry is facing um, for sustainable aquaculture feeds. And so at the very beginning, it's important that we give a definition, what we mean by sustainable development. And I use here the, the, the definition from, from FAO 2019. I'm trying to remove my face from these pictures. Uh, so the definition from FAO is sustainable development is the handling and conservation of natural resources and the orientation of technological and institutional change in such a manner as to ensure the continuous satisfaction of human needs for present and future generations. Such sustainable development conserves land, water, plant and animal genetic resources, is environmentally non-degrading, technically appropriate, economically viable and socially acceptable. The important thing to remember here is sustainability has three columns. One is environmental, but also we have a social one, and also we have an economic one. They're all important for um, the industry, and we have to look at all three of them, not just the environmental ones alone. And so our suggested criteria that Mark and I developed for sustainable aquafeeds were basically in four main areas. Um, I tend to think of it like a traffic light. Um, issues related to feed formulation and ingredient selection. Issues related to feed manufacture and feed quality. Issues related to on farm feed performance and impacts. And issues related to fish quality and food safety. And so what I'm going to do very quickly is go through each of these um, aspects from the point of view of sustainable aquafeeds. And so if we take the first one, feed formulation and ingredient selection, what we try to do is to come up with um, requirements, what we think the industry should be doing, and then recommendations, what, you know, the required ones are things that, that we should do. And, and the recommended is um, things that we would like to do, maybe. Anyway, let me just briefly go through what I mean. Required, the need to, and so most of these things are, are, are pretty obvious, but it's important that we, we, we spell them out. Number one, required to need to prohibit the use of non-sustainably managed marine feed resources. The need to prohibit the use of non-sustainably managed terrestrial feed resources, not just from the sea, but also from land as well. We need to prohibit the use of non-approved feed ingredient sources. We need to prohibit the refeeding of ingredients derived from the same species. 
we need to prohibit the use of spoiled and or adulterated feed ingredient sources. And we need to also prohibit the use of non-approved chemicals and feed additives. And so the, the recommendations here are the need to reduce country dependence upon imported feed ingredient sources and encourage the use of locally produced agricultural and fishery byproducts. We want to, the need to limit the selection and use of potentially food grade ingredient sources. We don't want to compete um, with, with other humans for the same ingredients. And also what's really important is that we need to formulate feeds to meet the nutrient requirements of the species that we're culturing. If they require certain nutrients, our job is, is to make sure that the feeds that we produce for these species contain those necessary, not only for optimum growth, but also for optimum health as well. And so in terms of the feed ingredients, we know that we have our, our plant oil, plant proteins, our, our oil seeds, our pulses, for example, soybean. And we also have our vertebrate protein sources, uh, the byproducts from the rendering industry. And the future is very much about using um, single cell proteins, bacteria, yeast, um, algae, different types of substrates that are much more sustainable. And also we have on the other side, um, the future of using insect proteins, invertebrate protein sources, um, which also have, um, you know, at the end of the day, when we, if we want to develop a, a replacer, the, the species that we grow, we grow, require nutrients. They don't require ingredients. And the job of the nutritionist of the feed formulator is to, is to make that that cocktail of ingredients to supply the necessary nutrients, whether it comes from, from fish meal and fish oil, or whether it comes from plant proteins, rendered products, or any of these other ones. Um, it's relatively easy to do this, but doing this consistently for 365 days a year of constant quality is not so easy. And with COVID at the moment, one of the problems is that ingredient prices are increasing, but the prices of the product of the commodities we're farming are not necessarily increasing. So every year we have to make improvements. And the same goes with fish oil. There are many current um, alternatives on the market, plant oil seed meals. We also have the oils from the rendering industry. And also the future is all about using algal oils or transgenics oils to supply those nutrients that that traditionally have been found in fish oil. And the industry is coming up to the plate and, and um, is starting to develop these, these products more and more. In terms of feed formulation, you know, on the on the left side we have the the nutritional considerations, the, the nutritional profile, the nutrient availability, the presence of anti-nutritional factors, the presence or not of environmental contaminants, the physical characteristics of that ingredient, does it require grinding, its variability in composition, and also its potential functional properties. And then on the other side, we've got the economic and market issues, price, 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 and market availability. And then we also have the market acceptability and sustainability issues, such as fish meal and fish oil use, animal protein use issues, the use of genetically modified ingredient issues, fighting ingredient dominant issues, environment and climate change issues, social, religious, labor, and possible food security issues. But the bottom line is that you've got this increasing market trend for transparency in feed and food production. People want to know where their food comes from and how it's being produced, and above all, it has to be safe. In terms of feed manufacture and feed quality, um, we need to look, I'm getting all these messages as I'm talking, so I'm just making sure that I'm not uh, overstepping my time. In terms of the feed manufacture and feed quality required, the need for the feed plant to follow all national laws and regulations, including internationally recognized aquaculture feed standards and possible GMPs or BMPs. The need 
for the feed plant to have a dedicated in-house laboratory for quality control. So many factories sometimes to try and save on 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 plant uh, funds uh, dispense with having a an in-house laboratory. It's really important, you know. Quality feeds only come from the use of quality ingredients, and we have to monitor that. And it's very important. And also, we need this transparency regarding ingredient use and nutrient levels on feed bags. Um, I'm going to give examples of these uh, further on. Recommend, recommended the need to minimize the use of meal sweepings and processing waste in finished feeds. The need to establish a dedicated R&D program for the in-house testing of feed additives and feed ingredients and for measuring nutrient digestibility. And the need for feed plants to allocate sufficient funds and resources, including staff, for data collection and technical support to farmers. At the end of the day, we produce a feed which is given to farmers, but also the farmers need to be supported in terms of the use of the feed. Um, there are many good aquaculture feed management practices guidelines developed. These were the ones developed by FAO. We have some more recent ones um, developed by the Global Aquaculture Alliance, but also many other bodies are, are doing similar guidelines. Again, these guidelines are there to, to help the industry develop in a, in a, in a more sustainable way. Um, the importance of in-house R&D for feed development. Again, this is a good example of a feed company um, in India, India Growel, uh, where they have the feed plant, but also they have an indoor laboratory, um, innovation laboratory where they can test their feeds, but also they have cages outside where they can also test their feeds. This is a similar feed plant in Indonesia with uh, this is the feed plant, and here we can uh, test different rations for shrimp, or this one in the Philippines for for tilapia. Uh, this is an example of. Um, sorry, I'm getting these questions. This is a good example of good labeling, where um, this is a, a feed in, in from Brazil has 40% protein, quorum sensing, uh, gives um, gives information on this ration should be used for the shrimp from post larvae to one gram in size. The basic list of ingredients used, the possible substitutes, uh, the level of nutrients guaranteed from proteins to amino acids to, to minerals and vitamins. Um, and also uh, information about the use of genetically modified ingredients in the product and uh, that the product does not contain products from, from ruminants. But this is a good example of, of good labeling. All too often, you have a label which says just the proximate composition and very little else. And at the end of the day, you know, we, um, we are producing food and so we should be very clear what we can use and what we cannot use. So this deals with on-farm feed performance and impacts um, in terms of what's required, the need for farmers to monitor and record feed intake, their biomass, survival and economic FCIs. The need for farmers to store feeds under protected, cool and well-ventilated conditions. The need to prohibit the top dressing of feeds on farm with non-approved feed additives and feed ingredients. The need to optimize feed intake and feed efficiency for the particular farm conditions of water temperature and of oxygen levels. The need to monitor the environmental impact of their feeds and minimize potential negative impacts through either through water recirculation or effluent treatment, IMTA control prior to discharge. Recommended the need to encourage farmers to establish a dedicated in-house R&D facility for diet testing, optimizing feed management, and maintaining profitability. And also the need to increase communication and dialogue between farmers, feed millers, and researchers so as to optimize on farm feed management and profitability. Next slide, please. And so here is an example of, in particularly within Asia, it's, it's very common 
for uh, for farmers to top dress their feeds with with different feed additives. Sometimes the feed additives here um, can be many of these suppliers also sell feed additives that farmers should not use. And so this is where I, I say that we should not use uh, non approved feed additives. But it's very difficult to to police this this activity. The next slide um, shows. And so what's happened is is especially with with poultry is because of the the incidence of disease and 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 the need for biosecurity. Most of the poultry production is controlled, is conducted indoors in a very biosecure environment an environmentally controlled environment where the animals feed 24 seven. The same is is going to happen in the future with many of our aquaculture species. Um, at the moment, we grow them in an open environment where we have uh, a succession of diseases and it's very difficult to uh, to actually keep the culture system in a, in a biosecure way. And so a lot of the future is, is going to be conducted um, under more biosecure. Uh, conditions where where the stresses of of changing environmental conditions can be managed more closely, and so you know we are many years uh, behind the poultry sector in this respect. But I think in the end we're going to be going the same way. The next slide, please, shows um, in terms of feed quality and food safety. Uh, again, this is. Very, very important. The need to ensure that the feeds used by farmers have no negative effect on the nutritional quality and safety of aquaculture products. We are producing food for human consumption. And so we should only be using, we should be very careful with the types of ingredients we use. We need to monitor also the nutritional composition, quality and safety of aquaculture products destined for direct human consumption. Recommended need to encourage the nutritional enhancement and health attributes of aquaculture products through dietary fortifications. If we want, we can do as they do with poultry or they do with milk. If you want to put a higher DHA level or higher level of, of a particular nutrient, we can do that through dietary fortification. We need to pr promote public awareness and understanding concerning the nutritional and health benefits of farm aquatic food products. From a nutritional point of view, we have something that is is so nutritious and good for us, but we need to blow our trumpet and, and, and tell people that. And finally, we also need to encourage the use of trimmings, offcuts that come from, you know, when we process our, our fish, we have these offcuts that sometimes we we either turn that back into fish meal, but what I'm saying is that we should try and encourage the use of these products for direct human consumption, lower cost processed foods, for example. The next slide shows um, an example of that, and that is that you have a, here a tilapia filleting plant, and then in the corner from these byproducts that come from the from a food grade product, you can also produce other products um, for direct human consumption, which are lower cost, but also at, uh, at go targeting the 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 more poorer poorer segments of the market in terms of of cost. Then after that, please, um, I think, and so I have a couple of concluding slides. Um, I think I've already overstayed my stay. Um, in Asia, as we all know, over 91.6% of global aquaculture production is currently produced, over 110 uh, million metric tons. And aquaculture is viewed very positively as a much needed provider of high quality and affordable aquatic food products. Okay. And so the important thing is that we have the three pillars of sustainable development. We have the environmental one, we have the, the social one, and that is that we have to produce food and also an employment. And also we have the the um, the economic one in that we have to provide job, job, job opportunities for people. So this is very well um, understood in, within the Asian community, uh, within Asia, where the bulk of aquaculture is produced, but it's not always seen in the same vein um, in other parts of the world. The next slide shows um, 
And so the important point is is you know the we have to realize the important role played by fish and seafood in human nutrition and global food supply, whether it's farmed or whether it's fished. And the next slide I think shows, um, you know, and so in many developing countries, fish is one of the cheapest and richest sources of animal protein and essential nutrients. Um, in most Asian countries, it's like this. In other parts of the world, fish isn't always the most, uh, the cheapest. And so that's why also the consumption is, is a lot less. The next slide shows um, that fish is not only a source of protein, but it's a it's a close to a superfood as as there is. I mean, it's it's full of uh, many different essential nutrients, whether it's proteins, essential fatty acids, minerals, or or vitamins. It really is a a perfect food source. And the next slide shows um, compared to terrestrial products. Um, most aquatic products have a higher higher protein content and also the the fatty acid profile is normally normally of the omega-3 type whereas uh, most terrestrial products are have much more calories have less protein and the fats tend to be saturated and of the omega-6 series so from a just by looking comparing with terrestrial products you can see a big difference the next slide shows um the latest data, for, again, from, from FAO 2021, the latest food balance sheets, the global average is 16.9% of our animal protein is coming from fish and shellfish. Uh, but also what you can see is that even though countries, the per, ca per capita consumption in, in countries like Africa is low, uh, the importance in the diet is very, very high, as you can see here. Over 60, 70 percent of the total protein intake, animal protein intake in in these countries is coming from fish and seafood. Asia, we know because most of the production is coming from aquaculture. In Africa, most of this production is coming from from capture fisheries. But you can see that although only 16.9 percent on a global basis. For many countries, fish and seafood um, plays a very, very important and, and, and central role. And I put here Brazil as a good example uh, where we have um, a low consumption of fish. The main reason why there's a low consumption is because it's quite expensive. The next slide shows um, uh, a project that we just been awarded um, Fish for Health, Improved Nutritional Quality of Cultured Fish for Human Consumption, Pescado para Saúde. And it's for the state of Sao Paulo. And the aim is really to, to improve the quality and the nutritional value of the fish consumed within the state. The next slide shows that, um, you know, within Brazil, within many countries, we have a, a, another type of malnutrition and this epidemic of obesity. And obesity, coronary heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, primarily due to the increased consumption of lower cost fast foods, okay, processed foods. The next slide shows more examples of these. Um, one more slide, please. Uh, you know, and, and the reason why I'm bringing it up is, is at the moment, uh, about over 50, you, Obese people are more likely, are 50% more likely to get, um, have serious complications from COVID and um, from, uh, and so there is a, a relationship that's very important. Uh, the next slide uh, shows, you know, and the fast foods that we consume are, are things like processed red meats, processed refined carbohydrates, fried foods, sugary drinks, and uh, and our, our sweet tooth. The reasons why we consume them is the next slide showing basically that it's, um, they are low cost and affordable, bigger portion sizes, increasing convenience and taste and accessibility. People are eating them because it's affordable, the poorer segments of the community even more so. And um, the next slide shows 
you know, and the other issue we have is that we have this sweet tooth and our addiction to sugar. The next slide shows that this addiction can get uh, quite high. You know, some countries, the US, Guatemala, over 15% of the total calorie intake is in the form of sugar and sweeteners. Um, in Asian countries, it's a lot less, um, but you can see that we have this addiction. And as a consequence, we have this, this problem of, of diabetes and, and hypertension as well. And so the next slide is showing the, and so the project essentially is, is, you know, the overall aim of the project is to promote the increased use of farm fish and seafood um, as a more healthy alternative to the consumption of processed red meats products and fast foods. Um, again, in Brazil, there is a, a obesity, coronary heart disease, diabetes is a very, very serious problem. And so what we want to try and do is to use aquaculture, to use captive fisheries as well, and try and educate people and, and try and produce uh, products for, for mass consumption. The next slide shows, I think a couple, some of the partners involved in this project, universities, it's funded by FAPES, the Sao Paulo Research Foundation, but also we have some feed companies, some feed additive suppliers, Vermares, uh, Fileo, Biomar, Polynutri, who are also helping the product, uh, the project in terms of, of logistical support and also with some of the trials that we will do. Uh, I think the final slide here is showing uh, you know, part of the project is product is project is also how we can improve the nutritional value of the of the tilapia or the shrimp for human consumption. That is by dietary supplementation uh, with essential nutrients. The next slide, I think, is the final one. And, and so the main project activities is first of all, what are the main products? You know, and this type of product project we could do in many, many parts of the world and, um, you know, to try and help people. So first is a market survey. What are the main products being consumed? Secondly, what's the nutrient content and quality of the major consumed products? Thirdly, monitoring the variability in the nutrient content and quality of these products over a complete year and the feeds used to produce them. Uh, number four, enhancing the nutrient content and potential health value of, of these products through dietary fortification or the use of new processing techniques to produce lower cost um, processed aquaculture products. Finally, to also improve the nutritional quality and profitability of tilapia production using genetic markers and genome-wide association. And finally, the important one is, is increasing public awareness and understanding concerning the health benefits of increased fish consumption. So I'm sorry that I um, rambled on. I think that was, this is the final last slide, but really clearly aquaculture needs to be viewed more holistically. And also that the social and economic impacts and benefits of the sector are also considered in the overall assessment of the long-term sustainability of the aquaculture sector for future generations. Every day, if you look at the latest data from FAO, every day aquaculture currently produces 329,000 tons of food products, 154,000 tons of fish, 95,000 tons of aquatic plants, 48,000 tons of mollusks, and 28,000 tons of crustaceans, valued at over $0.75 billion per day. The sector employs 20 million people worldwide. Again, we, we have a lovely sector. It's very diverse, but also we need to promote it and, and, and blow the trumpet sometimes when, when we need to. I think that was the, the final slide. And I, yeah, so this is just summarizing what I just said. Uh, we need to, have a holistic approach when we think about sustainable development, looking at the economic impacts, the social impacts, and also the environmental impacts. Okay, so with that, thank you very much, and uh, sorry for waffling on too much as usual. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Albert, uh, for 
very nice, you know, presentation with the statistics, the the latest statistics on uh, the aqua aqua food production. I would say uh, worldwide, and the challenges we have uh, with the feed industry. I, I I will try to phrase some some questions uh, on on that. And uh, in there, I think one of their earlier papers, right, in two thousand eight. Uh, you talked about global overview of fish pin and fish oil use, right? And you showed that before that, before 2008, there is a decrease in fish pin, fish oil use, uh, you know, in terms of percent based in the formulation. So the question is like, where are we uh, at uh, today in terms of fish meal, fish oil use in aqua feed? To both of you, but I will try to start with Mark first. Well, I think, uh, first of all, you need to understand that uh, the paper of 2008 was uh, was already considering, and it's basically on the, the fact that uh, Albert have a good vision of the, the the industry, is the fact that there was a limitation of the resource, and basically also um, the fact that at a certain point, it was uh, this, this, this idea of being uh, depending on this, this resource. And so uh, the numbers, the numbers right away is now inclu including this, but you have to also understand that the production is, is increasing also, the aquaculture production increasing. So of course, the technology, the, the alternative and so on are growing up, the, the use of byproducts to, to do a, another type of, of fish meal, the improvement of, uh, of uh, nutritional aspect made that there was this decrease in, in terms of, 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 uh, of consumption. Maybe Albert, can you com Please. complement this? Albert? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, um, I think in the early days when, when there was a lot of fish meal and fish oil and, and, and it was relatively cheap, um, yes, the industry was quite dependent on it. But as we've learned more about the nutrient requirements of the species that we're farming, we realize that that at the end of the day, the reason why fish meal and fish oil is such a good ingredient is because all the nutrients that the animal requires are contained in that. So if we want to replace that or, or to reduce the level used, we have to also supply those nutrients from other sources. And I just think the industry has, has matured a lot more um, in, its, in its ability to reduce its reliance on, on these precious commodities. Um, also what's happened, whereas in the past, a lot of the fish meal and fish oil was from, uh, you know, dedicated fisheries. Now a lot of the fish meal and fish oil is coming from, from you know, fish processing waste and um, the byproducts from fish processing. So, um, yeah, yeah. I, I, know, I, I don't... Right, go ahead. I, I, like I look at yes. So, so yeah, but go ahead. Sorry. No, no. I mean, I don't think of it. You know, when we formulate feeds now, we don't necessarily think, oh, we must put put fish meal in there anymore. You know, at the end of the day, it's it's about cost and what we're producing and the and the production system. Obviously, for a carnivorous species, they're a bit more picky. It's a bit harder. But at the end of the day, they need they require nutrients, not ingredients. Mm -hmm. I think few years ago I was doing some calculation that uh, right now, more than quarter of the fish meal coming from the processing industry. So that's a kind of a good number that coming in today from the processing industry uh, as as fish meal or fish oil. So uh, the second question is, uh, it's the uh, we, we have seen right this uh, recent rise in the price of soybean meal and it created a lot of troubles global globally also the the risk of you know like suddenly the 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 uh, what do you call the transport the the ocean transport can can be jammed and uh, the price to transport products could go up right once a, a dollar kg uh, i think calcium uh, Phosphate was right like seven dollar because of sometimes because of the cost of transport. It's like seven times higher than the than the product itself. It is, this is happening. So the, what what what, do you, what are your thoughts about the current situation in the demand and supply? Right. So okay, maybe demand is there, product is there, but we cannot supply. Uh, and should we include that? That's that is your 2011 paper on demand and supply paper, right? So should you include the price volatility? 
in, in, in the demand and supply of the raw material and how to address that volatility in supply and price of raw materials. Can, is, is it clear? Or? Yeah, I mean, for example, I mean, one of the things that's happened during COVID is, is we realize where our food comes from and our dependence you know, and, and the thing is about aquaculture is that many countries, especially many a Asian countries, uh, are dependent on imports to supply the ingredients. And and the prices of these ingredients are, as I said at the very beginning, is they're increasing and they're increasing at this day a lot. And but but the price of the commodity of the species that we're growing are not necessarily growing, you know, are not necessarily increasing. And so it means that every year we must become more efficient in our production systems. We locked, we have to reduce the cost per kilo of production. Um, and so there's, you know, much more pressure in the future is going to be on trying to use local ingredients and resources. Again, it's a circular economy. <coughs> it's right. transportation also uses a lot of energy. Right. Yeah. Uh, but that I think also the, the opportunity to have uh, alternatives for different sourcing. Of course, the local sourcing is is important. Sometimes it's possible, sometimes it's not. But I think in terms of sustainability, this is this definitely the, the way forward. And so, when you have a different option for for producing your your feeds, it's always better in terms of sourcing. So that's also uh, to have the choice about the. Yeah, of course, you you're looking for a specific specific compound but if you have all other options and that is so depending on one type of sourcing it's it's always better for sure. so i have an additional then, okay go ahead additional yeah, then, uh, sorry go ahead albert no and then the other issue related to that which also deals with the sustainability issue is that many of these products in those countries are subsidized mm -hmm. you know so it's not the real price you know, so, it's um, so additional question uh, to that that you 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 were you were talking about you were talking about uh, making local ingredients more available, increase the use of local ingredients. Do you think it'd be uh, better uh, to to have a regional perspective into that? Maybe one single country doesn't have all ingredients, or so if instead of international or global, if we have a regional collaborative effort or uh, you know initiatives to share raw materials like say uh, palm, palm products are very like widely available in Indonesia and uh, Malaysia. They're uh, cop copra meal uh, widely used in uh, in Philippines. Do you think some kind of regional initiatives would be useful in terms of uh, reduce this dependency on, you know, I mean, I think, I think, I mean, I mean, most feed companies international or national ones they're all they all want to try and use as much as possible local ingredients but like you say the problem is to produce something of a constant quality for 365 days a year is is not so easy but but i do think that regionally we can we can do technology exercises you know using if you remember we talked before about fermentation technologies to improve the nutritional value of locally of local ingredients which tend to be low in protein high in fiber but through enzyme addition or through fermentation we can really improve that but each region has different types of products whether it's palm oil or copra in asia and in, in brazil it might be sugar cane it might be other other right. types right. of products so I think regionally we can do it in terms of the ingredients, and um, I also yeah. think that uh, because we have okay locally available ingredients, so we try to use locally. Singapore for us in Singapore is no option. We don't have locally available, so we would have to uh, rely on regional or neighbor countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, or Vietnam, or around here so but also it also depends it's not only available but they should also be coming from sustainable sources Good. so for example uh, fisheries if you have 
uh, illegal fishing, even or some other, for example, soybean meal from Brazil, maybe it's not, there's a high production, but maybe not all in a sustainable matter, manner. So I think um, it's uh, uh, quite a challenge to do this, to find the sustainable source of these uh, all sorts of ingredients because different producers or different farmers will have uh, different certificates or not have certificates. Okay, thank you, Fanny. I think our next question will be uh, alternative, alternatives to fish meal, fish oil. So as Albert said, and Albert uh, and Mark said in the presentation that nothing is trash, right? Fish is food. Uh, so is using like the, to replace fish meal, fish oil, right? There are algae uh, or there are other marine products, there are insect meal, right? So the question is, what are the issues and challenges we have to achieve like uh, these uh, sources uh, sustainably, right? And more economical way. It's not economical today, right? Insect meal is not economical today. Algae meal is not economical today. Algae oil is not economical today. It's uh, like, I know it's economical scale, but if you can keep a little more, uh, your thoughts on this issue would be useful. Who, who wants to go first? Mark or Albert? Mm -hmm. Or Fanny? No, I mean, so, no, you go ahead to uh, go ahead, uh, Albert. Oh, please, young blood first. <laughs> no, I think it's uh, it's it's important to develop this to to the to develop these alternatives, and definitely we see more and more in trials and and so on that there's there's potential. Of course, when we talk about global market and so on, there's the economical that will dictate the thing, but it's it's always better to have these alternatives and to try to push and then we'll see how it goes. I think it's of course in terms of, of sustainability there's there's advantage digital at disadvantage in some or others, but but there is always always good to have these opportunities and and I'm sure with the time it will be much more efficient in terms of of energy of of and will be cheaper. It's just a matter of scaling, but but at least we know that it's potential. The potential, we know that it's working, and it's just that at certain point we need to see case by case again at the regional scale. It will be interesting to see also the, the availabilities and so on. But for me, it's, I think it's it's always yeah. good to see what's what are the options and push for that. Yeah, I mean, I think the, I think the important thing to remember is just you know our estimate at the moment is 56 million tons of aquaculture feed so we need millions of tons of those ingredients the the, the good potential about um, insect meals um, marine invertebrates or or single cell proteins is that you have the ability of growing them in the countries where you have the feed industry you know you can use local waste streams you can use local um, cheap sources of of energy to produce them in those countries, you know, and so that's going to be really, really important in the future. Instead of, you know, at the moment relying on a, an existing commodity that's potentially food grade and, um, and turning it into feed. And so, but it, it is all about scale. And then so, but most of the feed companies are very much interested in these algal SCPs, bacterial SCPs, insects. But at the end of the day, they're going to need millions of tons. And then at the end, we have to convince the consumer that these products are, you know, that we can use these products in, in our feeds. I think Eastern, Eastern seaweeds also can add it to that, right? So uh, not from this wide sustainability questions, raw material questions, we will move to a, a political questions. A little bit political question, right? Uh, we we all talked about that. Uh, I think the, the video came out uh, in Netflix a few weeks ago. I don't want to say the name, but like the question is, you have a fish matters uh, pep paper, right? And my question was, does fish really matter? And it's about wild fish, right? 
like when fisheries are uh, dwindling, we know we talk about some 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 fisheries are growing, some most of the fisheries are are dying, but fish from the wild, right? We we used to think fish from the wild is super good, blah blah blah, all these things, right? But when we catch the fish top of the food chain, we have a lot of issues eating them, right? So who is saying WHO is saying right for pregnant moms they cannot eat. Uh, a, a tuna mo not more than once a, a month or once a week, right? Because of heavy metals and toxins issue. So uh, it's like, question is, is wild fish any good given that we are using our open water bodies as toilets? So this is a political question, like uh, I think you, you can try to answer uh, all three of you, right? We are using our water bodies as toilets, right? And the no, fish I, coming yeah. from there, please go ahead. No, I mean, the important point, I mean, that's why I, I showed the, 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 a table showing the importance of fish in the diet of many African countries. Those African countries, most of the fish they consume are small pelagics, okay? You know, not, who can afford a tuna, excuse me? Yes, okay, other, maybe some high countries that have got the money in their pocket, they can afford the tuna, but... So captive fisheries, artisanal fisheries play a very important role. The thing about the, this Netflix video that came out was that in the video, parts of it were true, but also parts, there was so much misinformation in that video. And, and the aquaculture industry has got to learn to be more proactive than reactive. I mean, the only thing that it did was that the BBC, GAA, many different organizations came out with a response. But we should be doing that all the time. And and so and and that was my final point in my presentation today was that from a nutritional perspective, we have a product that is so much better than most of the other foods that we consume. But we have, you know, but you know, but we have a an industry sometimes that whether it's captive fisheries or aquaculture, we produce fish. But um in the end we have to work together, not against each other. Okay, Mark. Uh, I will not comment on the the, the, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the movie because uh, I saw also think there was a there was a lot of good uh, miscommunication about aspect and, and misleading aspects. So but definitely coming back to your question about the, the importance of fish and uh, is it wild fish good? Definitely it is. Even we need to care, take care of our ocean, of our seas, it's super important, but fish are in, so important. And definitely we need to fight against these illegal fisheries, the, the, the excess of, I mean, try to respect, I mean, the fact that we have a, a, set, a limited resource, but I would not say that fisheries product and especially from wild fisheries product are, are any, any bad. I think it's, you have regulation and you can see that there's a, a check on the before consumption. So definitely this is something we take care of. And this quality insurance, quality, uh, quality assessments, and be sure about the food safety. This is true for aquaculture and this is true for fisheries. And uh, basically, yeah, I will. I think it's it's important to, to see how more sustainable we can take care of our ocean. But at the same time, we have to know that we have a super product with fisheries. I mean, uh, the, 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 the talk of, of, of Robert showed that, and definitely this is something that needs to be on the, on the basket of, of from a wide range, from the poorest of the poor to the, to, the, to, the, to rich. The only thing is to be production or capturing sustainably. That's, that's the important thing for me, I think. Okay, thank you, Mark. Fanny, any, any uh, comments? Oh, on yeah, this? I agree with well, both Albert and uh, Mark. We need to have more access to fish, either the seawater or fresh water, because some countries are don't have access to seawater, but still can have freshwater fish, which is also a good source of nutrient, healthy source of nutrient. And also, we have to be more proactive. Yes, because we still, I still have friends asking me, is aquaculture fish healthy? Is it, do they give uh, antibiotics? Is it uh, a lot of dye in salmon uh, yeah. filet? Yeah. So is it very artificial? So they don't understand because it's 
for them it's natural how we farm other animals. They don't even question, well, some may question about how you intensively uh, farm chicken, but they don't really ask that much. But when it comes to fish, they really get concerned if, oh, is it full of, I don't know, po uh, antibiotics and other chemical products. So we have to do this uh, uh, awareness so that people consider fish either for uh, farming or catch of fish, I mean, capture fish, that they are healthy sources of. We have these issues for high, uh, the top in the predators that they might concentrate, they will concentrate the heavy metals. But as Albert said, it's not so frequent that we have access to this kind of fish. We still have, but uh, we, and also Mark said, so there is a control of a, the concentration, so we should still be safe for human consumption. But we have to increase this awareness. Some countries don't need this awareness. For example, Japan and some countries, Indonesia, mm -hmm. they it's really part of their diet. It's the that restaurants are not part, so it's the opposite. But for example, in Brazil, it's very hard to make people eat fish either because it's too bony, so it's a lot of trouble, or because it perishes easily. So there's a lot of uh, education we have to do for since young age, since small kids at school, I think, and also including the school diet. Good point, uh, Fanny. So I, I, I will now, we, I think we have 10, 12 minutes uh, more. I will go, go to the, I will, I will go back to uh, audience, the questions from audience. So the first one is from uh, Sarifin, Dr. Arifin, right? I think he's in Thailand. Uh, he's, he has done some uh, feeding trials with uh, algae oil and vegetable oil in C yes in CBS diet, uh, and he, they observed that DHA and EPA in final fish field carcass was uh, there was a difference between the two, right? Uh, and also gene expression for delta six fatty acid uh, this, this saturation, I guess, was higher four times. So. He wants to know what are, is the most, like the what is the best way or better way to incorporate DHA EPA in, in the in fish, say for tilapia, for example, right? What is the best way? I think we can take a minute or two on uh, to, to talk about this, uh, Albert. Yeah, I mean certainly, I mean commercially now we you know we can we we can buy oils already that that are that contain 25% or 30% DHA or EPA, you know, there are various companies that are, that are doing that already. Um, and it's the same way as, as we, we add the DHA to our milk or to our eggs. You know, we can just use those feed additives in feed and actually, um, you know, produce a, a more functional food. You know, nutritionally it's sound, but also we can, you know, increase some of these these nutrients um so you know the industry is already doing that i mean we i started with a company called advanced bio nutrition over 20 years ago uh where they were growing trying to look at different algae as as source of either epa or, or dha and um no it's going to be done at the moment those you know some of the products are still quite expensive but as competition and production goes up, then it's you know it's gonna the price is gonna go down. But certainly, yeah. you know, but certainly the fortification of of our food to meet consumer demands, for example, for pregnant women or for children or for special needs, could be a you yeah. know an important vehicle in future. Thank you, Albert. Thank you, Albert. Uh, I would also like to uh, uh, read some comments from uh, our audience. Uh, Dr. Rui Gonsalves uh, mentioned that if we talk regionally on producing locally to consume locally, single cell protein or any other fermentation technology could be a logical answer, right? I yeah. think we all, we all agree to that. And he also mentioned that locally available ingredients, um, quote, many types, unquote, may be used not only as a direct ingredient for diets, 
but as a source of energy for single cell protein fermentation. For example, plant meals rejected by the high level of anti-nutritional factors or non-use parts for human and animal food or feed. I think I think this all uh, makes sense uh, to all of us, right? Now, next question from audience is from uh, from uh, Brian. Th there appears to be lim limitations to the inclusion rates of single cell protein like bacterial protein. Well, it's I don't know. This could be nutritional limitation or could be also price factor could, could play, right? And he said, example maximum at fourteen. And what is your view on this as a crude protein ingredient, even though studies suggested possible inclusions at over 30? That's about single no, cell I, protein. I mean, I would put single cell proteins at a much higher level even than insect proteins, because at the moment, insect proteins really don't exist. A lot of people are ramping up production and and when we start getting into the into the the hundreds of thousands of tons, then we can consider it. But single cell proteins have been around for a long time in the form of yeast, more recently with algae. But companies, um, you know, but the, the advantage of a bacteria is that it can double its weight in half an hour. A yeast in two hours, an algae in six hours, in general terms, and so uh, the capacity of 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 bacteria and of, be, of being able to manipulate the nutritional profile of that bacteria through substrate selection and nutrient addition, to me, it's like a a Pandora's box. I mean, there's so much potential there to do, to do. and. Um, so the beautiful thing about it is that in future, the aim is to produce it locally within the countries where you, where you need it most. And so it's, um, you know, it really will. So I see a lot of future in in the the, the whole area of, of single cell proteins. Right. I think the, the food, food waste or feed waste streams can be used uh, to produce this protein and then recycle, right? So it can, it's a nice opportunity. So one of the questions from my other question from uh, I think this is uh, from from Jammu and Kashmir, Doctor Doctor Nasim, Doctor Nasim from from Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, I think it's India, and uh, she wants to know how sustainable is it to use macrophytes as a substitute to fish meal? This is a wonderful question, right? Uh, because uh, you, can, you can find in fresh water. They, they don't have any sea sea water or any marine algae, but they they have fresh water, right? And I think they have macroalgae growing in freshwater. This is a very interesting question is that how they can use these macrophytes uh, to substitute fish meal in aquadites. Okay, so, so, I mean, yeah. I mean, the number one produced fish in the world is grass carp, okay, a macrophyte eater. Macrophytes have a lot of potential. Again, there, there are many different types of many, that have ranges of, of, of nutrient composition. And also you have the, the marine macrophytes, the seaweeds, which again, it opens up a whole yeah, box of, 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 of potential products. Uh, many studies in India actually done looking at the whole variety of different, of different species. Um, and so I really think, you know, aquatic macro, but the important thing, there's one thing doing it in a small scale, at a farm level to do it industrially at a, a much higher level it's it's um, it's possible but you know just we just we have to find the market and obviously if it's a grass carp in china which is the largest producer of grass carp or in iran which also grows quite a lot of grass carp you can you can do that so mm -hmm. yes aquatic yeah. microphytes is and then just uh, my last ending on the aquatic microphytes is that you can also improve their nutritional value by fermentation. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. Uh, yes, uh, go, ahead. go ahead, Penny. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just go ahead. Said, we have a lot of uh, different alternative ingredients or different alternative products, but at the end, it will come to consistency of the 
nutritional content and also the availability. Unless we have a, like a niche market that the amount you produce is enough for this uh, feed you want to produce. Because then it's like for insect meal, it's still ramp, trying to ramp up the quantity. So there's a lot of people trying to prove that it can replace. So the thing is that, as Albert always say, it's not the ingredient itself. We have to replace, it's a source of nutrients. So we just see what nutrient it contains, contains and then we use as an ingredient. But we need to be a constant ingredient in a feed, it has to have availability and uh, consistency. consistency. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, we'll go back to uh, some of the papers. I guess, Mark, any any comments on that? Sorry. Uh, yeah, I fully agree with that. Uh, with those of them. Perfect. Okay. The consistency is super important, and the potential yeah. of microbiology or microfight or seaweeds is 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 great. But uh, depending on the consistency of the production, and definitely nutritionally for some some. I mean, originally. Um, Herbivore is definitely uh, an option, a uh, viable option. I think we will There's take five. One... Yes, go ahead, go ahead, Fanny. Go ahead, Fanny. There's one question from the audience that it could yes. be typed into the Q and A. So it says regarding using single cell source for omega three replacement, are there some other lipids or phospholipids that would need to be supplemented to make up for fissure complexity? Yes. No. I'm, again, the the mistake. I mean, I, I I just tend to be repeating all the things I always say sometimes. Fish oil is not just about EPA and DHA. Fish oil, like you say, it's a source of phospholipids. It's a source of vitamin A, vitamin D, cholesterol. Um, it's a whole nutrient soup. And if you want to replace that fish oil, which you can, which, you know, which is not really a, that difficult to do you you can but you have to supply those other nutrients too and um and uh, you know with many of these algal oils that yes they can produce epa or dha or arachidonic acid but you also have to supply depending on what you're culturing if it's a shrimp you're going to need to find cholesterol you're going to need to find some of these other other nutrients uh, fish oil also has a lot of inositol, has also a lot of choline, you know, it's it's full of other things. And so, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, we forget that sometimes these vitamins are also a fat component. So coming back to uh, your work, uh, both, of, both of your work. Uh, so you talked about, I think, about poverty, poor, uh, and mitigating poverty with, uh, with aquaculture, right? So... Uh, so my question is like with the, the development of modern farming, right, which is costly and then poor kind of effort to this. And this this shift is happening more and more small farmers are squeezed out and large corporate scale farming is coming in. And these small farmers have moved into the employment, right, in, in the industry. They're in the, still there in the industry, but they're moving into uh, regular employment uh, within the industry. So do you think that we need to shift our focus also the uh, the welfare uh, of this for better better wages, you know, living conditions of these people or who are employed in in in, in our industry. This uh, besides, because we have been focusing long time on poverty alleviation, which is which is of like little use today, with industrial farming coming in, right? Uh, globally, I know. Please, please. But we can, you know, we cannot use our standards for the whole world. You know, everybody is, every country is different. Every approach is different. And I, I like always to give an example of Indonesia. Indonesia is the second largest agriculture producer in the world. You, you saw from the numbers I gave, over 60% of the animal protein intake is fish. When they grow a catfish, they grow it to just over 100 grams small size because it's enough to fit on a plate with some rice with some vegetables when they grow colosoma or parapetinga they call it in brazil they grow small size they grow it for plate size they have low fcr boom 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 but they produce a lot but they produce it for certain markets you know and um all i'm just saying is that indonesia has the longest coastline in the world it's a real success story 
you know, like is Bangladesh also in terms of your aquaculture and, and, and fisheries there. And, and so I just don't think that we should use, you know, standards from other countries and impose it on them. You know, I just, you know, we have to be careful. I'm, I'm not talking about imposing, but we, I'm talking about that there are large farms coming in, right? There will be workers who are more, maybe moved out of farming and they are working in this industry, right? So, yeah. do, like, like large, sorry, even in Indonesia, there are large, large corporations working, right, with the large farms. So, that's why it's like, again, if you look at an FAO data anyway, it's they will say that still most of the aquaculture in, in Asia is small scale. You know, it's not the way it's done in other parts of the world. Um, right, right. You know, and I just think that we can learn much more from them than they can learn from us sometimes. Obviously, I agree. Anyway, sorry, it was just. You know, it's all right, Mark. That's our debate, it, Mark. No, uh, definitely we. It's a. Uh, it's a uh, that depending of where where we're talking about. Definitely, when we talk about Europe or Africa or Asia, this is different ways and. Is, I agree with the, the terminology of imposing, try to avoid the impose, imposing approach. Of course, the nature of our world, the current world is to go growing bigger and so more secure and so on, but it's not that it's the right solution, it's just that the fact is, let's see how it goes. The only thing is for the sustainability aspect that we talked about during the session is about to yeah, be sure and, and the recommendation that Albert was saying this is the more important thing, no matter what, if it's small scale or larger scale. Of course, it's easier with larger scale, but definitely it's a difficult to, to impose that. So. We have, well, we'll have two more questions uh, and we have three, I think we can take another six minutes if you don't mind. So the the second last question, Albert has talked about the, the largest uh, producer of aquaculture in the world about China, right? So, also the largest consumer of fish meal and fish oil. And if I remember right, uh, I used to uh, visit frequently there. And if I remember uh, correctly, even in some parts uh, of the country, in carp feed, feed millers were using 12% fish meal in carp feed. So the question is, is the situation or scenario changing in China? To both of you, or two or three of you, the second last question of the day. Yeah, Mark, you want to start because I know that you did some work. I did, I did, I did not hear the last part of the question, so I know about the the, 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 the inclusion inclusion of twelve percent. Then after, what was the final question about that? Like, is the situation changing in the country? Right in China, it's a global uh, producer and global uh, largest consumer of fish meal, fish oil globally, is the situation changing, right? Because they're using like everywhere, in, even in carp feed, right? We do not use any fish meal in carp feed per se outside China, but they were using 12% fish meal, fish meal at some point in some carp feed. So is the situation I've, I've, changing? I've, yeah, I have I've no recent uh, data about that and I did not check that, but definitely I think uh, with uh, the general general trends to to reduce this 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 amount i think there's and especially with the the, the the price on the market right now this uh this ingredient definitely there's there's a way forward but yeah i think that's that's what what is important is try to to reduce that because you it, it could be yeah we are there's so many opportunity alternative sustainable alternative that that could be announced but after a while it's up to the, the producer and 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 that's up that's not up to us. It's just uh, the value and so on in terms of uh, how you want to produce. I mean, we can only recommend. We cannot force people. And and basically, what will be making the change is the the price, the availability, the quality, and so on. Okay, Albert. I mean, again, China is uh, the second largest animal feed manufacturer in the world. Um, and the, yes, they're facing the same issues that the whole industry is facing, that they have to import their soya, for example, from the US or from Argentina or from Brazil, you know, and, and the prices of these commodities are going up. Carp feed, yeah, I think most people still use a little bit of fish meal in the, in the formulations that I've seen, yes, because fish meal is, 
there's so many different types of fish meal and different qualities and you can pick up some of the lower grade products at a very reasonable price and people want to use it at small amounts because sometimes it's because the farmer says i want you to put in at least five percent fish meal in in that feed um you know and as an ingredient as i said before it's um, it contains many of the nutrients that we're looking for um, but we can also produce a feed that for carp that has no fish meal. It depends on price and the ingredients and availability. And China has a lot of fish meal production of its own. 